Well, it's great to be here, and I appreciate all of you coming out at 8. I know it's getting close to dinner time, or you've been at the conference for a while, so hopefully uh, you'll enjoy this talk. So basically, I came up with this because I meet a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, and I have to honestly say that I envy a lot of first-time entrepreneurs because you have just that entire you know, enthusiasm and that bright-eyedness that after you have a couple startups, you, know, you start to get more gray hairs and you get a little tired. Um, but the other reason is because you, know, you have uh, a lot of mistakes to be made and a lot of learnings that happen, which once again is, is fun and exciting, maybe not while you're going through it, um, but that's what leads to the breakthroughs, right? So as uh, I was introduced, give you a little bit more background about myself. I actually started off as an R&D engineer. And after that, I realized I really wanted to build something, just a complete product, end to end. And so I had my opportunity when uh, I was chosen um, by Aaron Patzer, the, the founder of Mint, to help him start Mint.com. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Mint? Okay, so not everybody, I'll just I'll give you a little spiel about it. So Mint is a online personal finance website, and the way it works is it aggregates all of your financial accounts, your checking, your savings, uh, any student loans that you have so that you have a complete picture of your finances. It's really just limited right now to North America, and even in North America, it's Canada and US. Um, but we came out in 2007, and then ended up selling, sorry, we came out in, yeah, we came out in 2007, but we were working on it for a couple years before that, and then it got sold in 2009. So after selling it, I then had the opportunity to decide what I wanted to do next. And since I had been a founding engineer, I decided, well, it's time to do something just slightly different. And so that's why I decided that I, too, wanted to become that first-time founder. And so I started with BusyBee. And the premise behind BusyBee is that we help small businesses. Specifically, we help uh, fitness-based businesses like yoga studios and gyms. And the reason that I do this is because I have a deep passion for yoga. I've been practicing now for over nine years. And I just saw the market really growing over that period of time. And I saw a lot of inefficiencies in their business. But I also started to see a number of these businesses cropping up all over the US and all over the world. So I thought that there was a market opportunity here to build a software solution for them. Now, while I was building both uh, BusyBee as well as Mint, I started blogging on Femgineer. Uh, Femgineer is basically uh, about you know, engineering and entrepreneurship. In the last year, I've actually, once again, made another startup, uh, and it's focused on providing educational services to entrepreneurs as well as to engineers uh, or tech professionals. And m most, most recently, um, was invited to teach entrepreneurship at Duke. So those are all the various things that I'm working on. So what I want to cover today is sort of the first three steps that any first-time entrepreneur, whether they're an engineer, whether they're an entrepreneur, or coming from the business side, and whatever the background is, they need to take. And then I want to talk a little bit about financing, not a whole lot. Uh, I'm not going to give you any secrets to financing, so if you're fundraising here, you know, sorry, maybe there's a better talk on that. Um, and then I want to explain you know, why things take time and why sometimes you feel like time isn't always on your side. And then you know, there's really no one steady way to get to success, but we'll talk about how we need to think about success when we're a first-time entrepreneur. So the first thing that obviously you need when you're a first-time entrepreneur, a first-time founder, is an idea, right? But what I meet when I meet a lot of uh, first-time founders or entrepreneurs, the biggest problem that I hear from them is they've got way too many ideas. And it's very, very difficult for them to come and pick just one, because they fall in love with every single idea that they have. So the first thing I tell them is, look, you cannot fall in love with your idea. It's, it's great that you're so enthusiastic about it. But truthfully, this idea is going to evolve over time. And the reason it's evolving is because it's becoming better. So you need to fall in love more with the process of generating ideas and executing on them rather than the idea itself. The other thing I often tell people is don't get bogged down to that very specific idea. And instead, once again, or, you know, don't think that you have to pursue everything all at once. You will have more. You can start more companies. You can build more products or whatever your heart's content is. But the key is obviously focusing on one thing at a time. Now, 
The other thing that happens too often is they get in this mindset of, oh, I have to do a lot of things at once. I've got to build a product. I've got to put a team together. And then I've got to figure out how to fund this whole thing, right? So once again, these first time founders are getting pulled in a number of directions. And what ends up happening as they're getting pulled in all of these different directions is that you just get overwhelmed. Right? You're not sure what your product should look like. You're not sure how to get people to help you out. You're not sure how to find the funding you need to bring your idea into the market. And a lot of this you know, makes you feel overwhelmed as an entrepreneur. And then you get stuck. Right? You get stuck in a rut and you feel like there's no way out of it. You might as well just scrap the whole project. And a lot of times this is where ideas die. Not even products, but ideas. Because at this stage, people get very overwhelmed and they can't take that first next step. And instead, they think, oh, you know, well, that's, th that's the life cycle of my idea. I'm going to move on. And then, of course, this then feels like a failure, right? Well, I didn't bring anything to the market. I haven't really accomplished anything. I just had a lot of ideas. You know, you probably meet some of these folks that are always telling you things, but they're not actually doing anything once they have that initial idea. The other thing um, that a lot of people come to me and say is, well, you know, I'm a business person. How am I going to build anything? Or a lot of times I get a technical person. I say, well, you know, I know how to build, but I don't know how to market. So the truth, though, is it doesn't matter whether you are a business person or a technical person. The steps that I'm going to give you actually apply regardless. And the reason the steps apply, regardless of who it is that you are or what your background is, is because they're essentially dealing with validating what your idea is to begin with. So when we think about taking that first step, this is a common first step that people don't take, and this is why they get stuck in that failure mode or where you know, their idea basically goes to die. And that first step is you have to think about your idea in the context of a market. It doesn't mean that you have to think about how to productize it. It doesn't mean that you have to think about how to go get money for it. It doesn't even mean that you have to tell somebody else or recruit a team or anything like that. It just means you have to figure out if there is a market need for the product that you're trying, or sorry, for the problem or the idea that you have. So to give you a simple example, when uh, we were building Mint, the first thing that we did for pretty much the first six months was we went out and we met with a lot of people. Because we all felt like, oh, sure, we struggle with our personal finances, but it doesn't seem like anybody else really cares, right? I mean, there's obviously a lot of people that have are indebted to credit cards and a lot of other things. So we went out and talked to a number of people to see if they would actually be interested in a solution for personal finance. And then after we did this, we then thought about, OK, we've got a really wide spectrum here. There are some people who are in their early 20s, in their mid 30s, in their 40s, 50s, et cetera. And th some of them say that they really need a solution. Some don't. Some are happy with solutions that already exist there. You know, are there any common themes? And the common theme that we arrived at was that if we were going to build a solution, then it was probably going to be for people that were 20 to 30, very, very budget conscious. Because the people who were older, or the people that were more affluent, either had solutions or were happy with the products that were in the market. So then we decided, we had figured out what the market need was, and we kind of figured out who our early adopter would be. And that's where we started. And this is an area, once again, that people don't think about. This is oftentimes not the first step. Oftentimes the first step, if you are a business founder, is to scramble around and try to find your technical co-founder. Or if you're a technical founder, it's to scramble around and write some code or build, build something and put it out there. It's oftentimes not to get out and talk to people. So I want to emphasize that. Now, the second thing that people oftentimes overlook is having a level of domain expertise, right? Instead, they think, oh, let's just do whatever the coolest you know, thing is out on the market, or let's read some TechCrunch article, or let's read some other you know, media article and see what's getting a lot of funding or what a lot of people seem to buy, right? So, and that's when they end up creating a lot of copycats. So, the reason I say domain expertise is important is because this gives you a very unique advantage to create a product that might not even exist in the market today, or to at least have a unique approach to the creation. 
So when we came up with Mint, it wasn't by any means a unique product. There were other financial software solutions in the market, but there was nothing that was very, very simple. Same thing with my product with BusyBee. I was you know, one of very few people who had enough domain expertise to understand how the fitness market and the yoga market operated and to understand where we needed to start when we were building a product for the uh, segment that we were in, which were the very, very small independent studio owners. So think about what you have a domain expertise in. The other reason I say you need to focus on domain expertise is because remember, I said first time founders make a lot of mistakes, right? There's a lot of learning that happens. Well, if you're already starting from a unique vantage point of having domain expertise, there's less that you're going to have to learn. Now, you're still going to make some mistakes, but having a level of domain expertise, having a level of passion for that domain is actually going to help you through some of those trying moments. Now, once you've gotten that settled, then you can think about how do I recruit outside help? How do I then go out and find customers? So think about that after you focus on what it is that you are particularly an expert in. So what's step two, right? We said step one is you've got to make sure you understand your market, and you've got to find a problem in it, and you've got to come up with a customer segment. So step two is actually kind of tricky. And the reason I say it's tricky is because a lot of times people want to start small. They're like, oh, let's, let's just build something small. Let's, let's get the ball rolling. Let's put something out there. And I completely understand the need to do that. But there is always this competition with we need to have a big vision. We need to, as entrepreneurs, be changing the world that we're in, right? So a lot of times, first-time entrepreneurs come and ask me, how do you reconcile that? How do you come up with a big vision but still have a daily routine or a set of milestones over the course of days, weeks, months, and years? Well, the key to that is you, know, you obviously want to figure out where it is you're headed in the long term, but it doesn't really matter exactly how you get there, right? You're going to meander a little. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to take some different paths. But the reason that you want to start small is because when you start by overbuilding, right, you pull in a lot of people, you get a lot of funding, you pull in a lot of resources, then you end up wasting and not figuring out whether you're solving the right problem or not. So that's why you've got to start small, but then think about what the bigger vision is. So for example, with Mint, once again, the first problem that we were solving was that people have a lot of different financial data all over the place. Like I said, in their checking, in their savings, in their credit cards, in their student loans. And it was very hard for them to understand how their, fin their finances looked, how much money they actually had. So the very, very small problem that we started off with was, let's figure out how to give people a good understanding or a picture of how much money they have. That's it. Now, of course, the bigger vision was that we wanted to transform how people related to their finances. We wanted to start making progress in fi the financial tech space, offering a financial service, and we wanted to give common banks a run for their money. No, excuse the pun. And the reason that we had this big vision was because we saw a lot of areas in which we could make change. But we were a small team. We were four people when we started. So we had to start somewhere, and we had to start solving a s simple problem. The other reason you start small is because you're limited by resources, right? You can't do everything. And of course, the final is that you have to give people an idea, meaning customers or whomever you talk to, of what it is you're actually doing, right? What it is that first product or that prototype is capable of. So you might talk a great game of what you want to do in the future, but they want to know what does this actually do. And so that's the reason you have to think of a big vision, but start small. So let's talk about the third step. The third step is you know what you know. Right? And I've kind of talked about this before, that as first-time founders, you're not going to know everything. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. But the reason I bring this up is because too often, people confuse making mistakes because of a lack of experience and a lack of knowledge right, with the fact that they just give up and that things fail. Right? So oftentimes, you can't you know, if you don't know something, then you have to go out and learn, or you have to go out and experience it. 
The other reason I bring up this, you know, you know what you know, is because you want to sit and actually make a checklist of what your skills and what your experience and what your domain expertise is. This is once again something that a lot of, you know, first time founders don't do. They have a sense of it, but they don't obviously articulate it very well. Now, the reason it's really important to articulate this is because for the rest of the skills that you don't have, the rest of the experience or expertise you don't have, you can go out and recruit other people. So once again, at Mint, um, when we were starting off, the four of us, or actually the three of us initially, didn't have a background in security or privacy. And we knew that this was a, a, f a flaw of, of our knowledge. And so what we did is we said, well, the next person, the fourth person we hire, absolutely needs to be a security expert. And so when we made that the priority, we actually found the right person to take that job on, right? Didn't mean that we, starting off as the team, knew everything, right? So don't, don't think that you have to be omniscient as a founder. Think that, you know, you have to know what it is that you're, you know, and whatever it is that you don't know, you have to find ways of being resourceful and getting people on your side to help you out. Now, when I say recruit for the team, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I'm so smart, I can get this thing off the ground, you know, it doesn't really matter, I don't need a team, and plus other people, it's like having too many cooks in the kitchen, right? They're just gonna spoil it, or they're gonna take it in a different direction. Sometimes that direction can be good, as long as it's still with the vision, right? So the story that I bring up to a lot of my students is uh, when we first got started, or actually when Aaron was working on his own, Aaron Pastor is the founder, he had this wonderful name for the company. And it was called Money Intelligence, right? How many of you want to buy a product called Money Intelligence? Yeah, I didn't think so. And so one day we were, you know, going on a ski trip to Tahoe, and we were sitting in the car because there was a big snowstorm, we didn't have anywhere to go for a few hours. And then, you know, I said, you know, that name really, really sucks. I just think it's going to be a terrible name. And he's like, why? And I said, you know, I just think it's, if we're going after 20-somethings and 30-somethings, it's just not exciting, right? And he said, okay, well, you know, come up with something better. So I thought for a little bit of time, and I said, how about Mint? And that was my first contribution. So Aaron, you know, talking to me and being open to my contributions actually improved the overall branding of the company, right? And it made, helped create a name that stuck with people. So this is why you need other people to help you out. Even if you don't necessarily hire them to be full time, you need them to brainstorm. You need them to critique what you're doing. So think of that, you know, do you want to build a product that's money intelligence or do you want to build a mint? Right? This is oftentimes the story that you have to think about when you're deciding whether you want to go alone or you want to form a team. Now, a lot of times people will ask, well, you know, how do I actually go out and find these potential co-founders? Right? Seems really hard to recruit given where I am. There might not be other people interested in entrepreneurship. There might not be people who have the skills. So the first thing I always talk about is since you've made your checklist of what you know and what you don't know, Look for the people that have a complementary skill set. So if you are a business founder, look for that technical founder. Don't let it be the you know, thing that stops you from building, but look for people that have the skills that you don't possess. The other reason that this is good, right, is once again, it's not going to cause heads to butt, right? You'll have one person that's good at one thing and, and you'll be able to do something else as a result. So the other thing I talk about is to not do a sales pitch. Right? A lot of times people get so passionate about their idea that they want someone else to come and work for them, which is great. But too often people you know, get, a, get a little bit shy or get a little bit nervous when they're being sold something. So instead what I say is don't try to make an overt sales pitch to recruit somebody. Instead, get them involved in the idea. Have a brainstorming session. Talk to them about it. And then see how much they are interested in whether or not they want to contribute. And the final note is, just like you, know, you shouldn't be a salesperson, be careful about those people that come after you or are very, very eager to join your team. Because a lot of times they may not have the skill set, they might not have the discipline, or may, they might not have the quality of ideas to help strengthen your startup. So from this point, once you've kind of identified people that you are interested in recruiting, it's time to have some conversations. Now, these can be a little bit tricky because uh, oftentimes people don't want to talk. They just want to get stuff done, right? They are so eager to build.
But what I say is it's actually good to take a little bit of a step back and have some of these heated conversations and to talk about good experiences and bad experiences you've had with teammates, right? Whether somebody didn't pull their weight or whether somebody wasn't communicating well or whether they walked away with your invention, whatever it is, right? Talk about those things openly so that they understand where you're coming from. And then set up a clear standard for how you're going to communicate in the future, whether things are good or bad, right? This is after all, when you think about a co-founder, this is your partner. So who better to be honest with than someone who is your partner? And then think about the fact that there needs to be alignment in values, right? Too often when I see co-founders and their relationships dissolve, it's actually because they haven't taken the time to find some alignment in where, what it is that the company that they want to build, the product that they want to build, or even a shared vision of where they want to go. Right? And if that happens, it's okay. You know, it's not a, it's, it, these things happen naturally. Um, but the key thing is that you take the time to recognize it. Now, once you've had those conversations, once you've gone through the brainstorming sessions, you should be able to gauge how interested they are in working for you, right? People don't necessarily hide all of their uh, enthusiasm. So see then if they are interested, and then you can think about recruiting them to participate more fully. The other is, as they're making these contributions, think about the quality, right? Don't be so desperate that you're going to bring whoever you want, whomever you think uh, is open to working for you. Think about how good of a person they're going to be and how much uh, quality they're going to deliver. And then the final thing I oftentimes say is, you've got to think about chemistry and camaraderie, right? And what, that, what I mean by that is, are you able to actually work with this person for a significant amount of time? Right? Because this is going to be a stressful situation. So a lot of times, you know, you've got your co-founder situation, but that's not enough. Because once again, you know what you know, your co-founder knows what they know, and you need some more people involved. And a lot of times, advisors are great. Now, I'm not saying you have to, have to go find an advisor, but sometimes they can be useful. Now, oftentimes, I've noticed that when people go out and look for advisors, they make a couple mistakes. You know, they just basically tell anybody that they can participate. But the advisor relationship actually has to be a little bit more strategic and a little bit more guided. And by that, I mean you have to set up expectations for how the advisor is going to add value. And the reason that you want to do that is because a lot of times these people are already experienced, right? And so you want to make use of their experience. You want to make use of their network. So setting a expectations can help with that. The other is you want to make sure that there are some clear contributions. So if you want introductions or you want them to work on some of your product, let them know what it is. It's after all up to you. It's your startup. It's your idea where you're headed. So you know if they don't want to work on it, then that's fine. But make sure you get what you need out of the relationship. And then the third and final thing is realize that advisor relationships don't have to be permanent, right? We oftentimes think that this is a very tight commitment, but it doesn't have to be. It can be fluid. The reason it can be fluid is because your company is evolving, right? Your idea is, is also evolving. So you might need to bring somebody new in-house in order to brainstorm with you. The ex expert that you had might not even apply anymore. Now, so we've talked about co-founders and experts. We're talking about employees next, <clears throat> right? When's the right time to actually recruit an employee? Well, a common mistake that people make is they recruit too early, right? And I, I don't mean that recruiting in the sense of, once again, paying somebody, but just bringing them onto your team. You have to be careful about when you recruit people because if you recruit them too early on before you have a vision and before you have a plan, then especially if there's somebody technical, they feel like they're being pulled in a lot of directions or you as a founder don't know what you're doing. And the truth is you actually need to kind of you know, meander a little bit before you find your vision. So that's not the appropriate time to, build, to bring in a new employee. The right time to bring in an employee is once you've set the vision and you're ready to implement it. Okay? This doesn't mean that your vision can't change, but it sort of limits the amount of fluctuations that you're going to experience once you have a good idea of where you're headed. Now, it's not enough to just have a vision. You have to communicate it clearly to other people. You have to explain where it is they're headed. 
Now, the reason that you want to do this is just like Mark Benioff, the CEO and founder of Salesforce says, is that because people want to do things that are going to change the world. That's how you find the best talent. So you need to talk to them about what your vision is, how you think that you can change the world. That's what's going to get them excited, and that's what's going to keep them interested in helping you build. Because after all, people want to follow those who are also passionate, right? They think it's going to rub off on them. So when we talk about then things like team building and, and bringing in more employees, right? Probably wondering how to do that. So the one thing I always talk about is this concept of abilities versus capabilities. And so abilities are, you know, they might have some alphabet soup of technologies or programming languages they know or even skills that they have. But capabilities means what can they actually learn to do in the future, right? Are they a good public speaker? Are they just a good engineer in general? Are they a problem solver? Are they a team builder, right? Look for those capabilities. And the reason you have to look for these is because, once again, your startup is in flux. You don't know what you're going to need in the future in terms of skill sets. So when you hire for capable people, they are also able to adapt with those needs. And then the big thing, once again, that I notice with first-time founders that they don't do is giving people time to digest. Right? They kind of expect their employees to come in immediately, understand where they're headed, and then start executing. That's very hard if you're in some initial stages where you're still formulating the product idea, you're still building that first prototype. So give people some time to learn the technology they need to use and to also understand who the end customer is and what the product might be that you're building. Now, who likes being micromanaged in here? Okay, clearly nobody. Once again, I see this so often where people are so enthusiastic and so passionate about their idea that they're constantly polling their employees. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? Why isn't it done? Why is it taking so long? How can I help, right? This isn't the right way to get things done. What you actually want to do is you want to delegate and walk away. You have more important things to do, right? So the key to doing this is to have check-ins, maybe a weekly check-in, maybe a daily check-in, but let your employees do what they need to do. And you can then focus on where you need to be making contributions, right? On what you need to be doing, which is essentially advancing the company, finding more customers, recruiting more talent. Now, for those of you out there who might be bootstrapping, meaning you're putting your own savings into building a company, or you don't have access to capital immediately, here are some tips. The first is think about using people on a part-time basis. Right? Too often we think, oh, you know, Joe has a family, or he has kids, or Sally's got you know, a lot of things on her plate, I don't want to bother her. But truthfully, everybody can contribute a couple hours. They have to want to contribute a couple hours out of their week, but they can, right? So think about how you can get some part-time work out of people. The other thing is you can, of course, hire part-time people as well. Um, I like to use a service called Odesk. And the reason I like to use Odesk is because I can track all of the contractor's progress. And I can see reviews. I can propose projects, all of that stuff. So I oftentimes use this. But the key thing you want to do in either case is you set a budget, if you're paying for people, or you set a and you always set a clear set of deliverables, right? a timeline for when you can expect things to be done. And then, much like managing your team, you let people do the work, and then you check in with them to see if it's done. But the key in going this part-time direction is you've got to find people who have self-leadership skills, meaning you don't have to manage them. Right? And the reason you can't manage them is because they're working on their own time. They're working when they might have an hour or two free. So that's why it's important to find those who are capable of doing that, and they can just check in with you periodically. The other thing I say is if you're not sure about going down this path, start with a sample project. Give them something small, right? This is also a great way to get, to get an estimate of how long it takes somebody to finish something and the quality of their work. So whomever I hire, whether somebody I want to work with full-time or part-time, I always start with a sample project. And that way I get a good sense of the quality of their work, their interest, and you know, it also, of course, contributes to the product itself. So, you know, 
despite what I say, a lot of times you have to fire an employee or dissolve a partnership. This is just the nature of startups, right? We have to get comfortable with this. It's not fun, it's painful, but you know, as a first time founder, it will most likely happen to you. Now, if it happens, there's no need to panic, right? The key thing is you wanna start by thinking about what's the stake that your co-founder is going to leave with. And by stake, I mean, what's the equity portion if you had divided up the company, right? It doesn't always make sense for someone to leave with 50% of the company if they're no longer going to add value. They're actually doing a disservice to you in the future, right? You're not going to be able to attract future employees. You're not going to get future investment if there's some, you know, silent person sitting there not adding any value. So figure out a way where they can still get some contribution or something, you know, um, some uh, walk away present, um, but you can still get back a lot of the equity. And then of course, make sure that if you're the one that's going to continue building, that you control the assets. I get a lot of phone calls that say, my developer ran away with my code base, right? That should never happen. Um, and in general, it, you know, because you, sh you should always have some level of access. Um, but the key thing is that if you are the founder, you should have the assets or have access to those assets and to ask for them. And then there's a debate on when's the appropriate time to bring somebody new, right? I always say, you know, it's kind of a fresh wound. There's no need to just jump back out there and try to bring someone else in. You know, take your time to figure out what went well or what didn't go well when you recruited that person, whether they, you were a co-founder or they were an employee. Take some time to reflect before you bring the new person on board. The other reason you need to do this is because the next person in line is going to ask, well, who have you been working with for the last five, six, 12 months, right? So you have to have those honest conversations again about why the partnership worked or didn't work. So that's why I always say it's a good time to take, uh, it's good to take some time to reflect. The most important thing though for a first time entrepreneur is that you keep going. Right? You're going to have these setbacks. You're going to have the co-founder that leaves you. I certainly have had a couple in my past. And you're, you're also going to have a number of setbacks in terms of employees leaving or the idea taking a long time. Which brings us to this idea of how long it takes to build, right? Too often we over or rather underestimate the amount of time it's going to take to get something off the ground, whether it's we, you know, ourselves wrapping our brains around the idea that we want to bring to the market or overcoming certain mistakes or even becoming better leaders so that we can guide our employees. All of these things take a very, very long time. So the key thing, though, is once you've got that solid product, right, that you then have customers and you then have a company, you can then think about financing. Right? So a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, where do I find this money? So there's, it's a very controversial topic, the concept of financing. So I'm not going to you know, tell you how to go get money. Instead, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide how you want to get money, where you want to get money from. But there are some clear paths that have worked in the past. So a lot of it initially is bootstrapping, which means taking your own savings, putting it on the line, not all of it, but maybe some portion of it so that you can get things rolling. And then once you get through with that, it's thinking about maybe using a crowdfunding campaign, right? Or maybe you have some friends and family who'd be willing to contribute. And then the third is once you feel like you have enough of traction, you have enough customers, you can think about going and getting some private equity. So looking at an angel investor or a VC. But it's obviously a competitive space, which is why I always advise that you start off showing some level of customers, some level of revenue before you go out and do this. There are, of course, those who don't need to do this, but a lot of them are serial entrepreneurs who have been successful in the past and have returned money in the past. Now, after having said all of this, you know, there's unfortunately one key ingredient that we have no control over, and that's timing. And the thing about timing is it does funny things to your company and to your product and to you yourself as an entrepreneur. So the funny thing it does is obviously, you know, as you're 
as you're building, you're making a lot of mistakes, right? But then there's this light bulb moment where all the mistakes that you made suddenly start to make sense, why you made them, right? It was that lack of knowledge. And you get smarter as a result. And then, you know, your employees, they start to understand where you're doing and they're suddenly highly motivated. And then finally, you start to get credibility with customers, which is where the traction comes in. So it's basically sort of the harmony of all of these things. And needless to say, the only way to get the harmony of all these things is a level of timing, is a level of persistence. So it is tough. It's meant to be tough. It's not meant to be something easy, which is why very few people do it. And very few people are you know, around to tell the stories after they do it. But the key thing I want you to walk away with is to avoid this temptation to quit, right? That's sort of the, the thing. A lot of first-time entrepreneurs, you know, you don't want to just be a first-time entrepreneur. You want to be a second, a third, or a serial, right? So the key is to not give in to this temptation. When we talk about, again, this idea of success or failure, you know, a lot of it comes down to, of course, how you want to define it, right? A lot of people gauge failure as just giving up running out of money, not getting any customers, that's up to you. A lot of people gauge success as a monetary success, right? It's up to you. But once again, remember, there's a number of ingredients that play into your success. So ultimately, it's got to be your definition. The other thing that I want to leave you with is for you to figure out what your goal is. So for example, when I started BusyBee, one of the big goals that I had was to run a company that was very flexible so that I could have the lifestyle that I wanted. And I wanted to set it up so that it was a remote organization. That took almost two years to set up. Uh, fortunately, my co-founder came in with a lot of great experience, right? Those complementary skill sets. He had already been working remotely as a freelancer and he knew how to put a lot of process in place. Now this was very different from traditional Silicon Valley startups that we were friends with. You know, a lot of these people were raising a lot of capital and they were all working together, maybe in a garage or in a nice office space, whereas we were sort of all spread out all over the country and even, you know, some internationally. But our goal was a little bit different. Our goal was to build a profitable business and our goal was to have a lifestyle that we could all enjoy, which was to not commute anywhere. So think about what your goal is as you think about your idea, think about forming your company, and realize it doesn't have to be a traditional one that everyone else goes through. Once again, this might mean that the timing of what you're gonna experience will vary, but you have the power to make those kinds of choices. So to sum up, we talked a lot about the first three steps, right? First step is you've gotta think about the idea itself and how it relates back to the market, right? Too often people get so consumed with having too many ideas or they get too involved in building that they don't think about actually what's involved in the market. The second thing we talked about is, you know, you know what you know and you've got to try to recruit for the skills that you don't have, whether it's finding a co-founder, whether it's finding employees. And the third step is once you've sort of got that nice harmony, once you've got the vision in place, you start making those small steps, then you can recruit more people to get involved in your project. And just because you're recruiting more people doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a lot of money to do this, right? You can find part-timers, you can find people that are capable. But the key always is that you explain what the vision is to them so that they keep their motivation up. And sometimes people will leave, we just have to get used to that. But the biggest thing is there is this waiting period, that there is this element of time where there will be a harmony amongst a number of things and that's what's gonna help you find your stride. But a lot of that is making a lot of mistakes, you know, not feeling like you're not succeeding uh, until you get to the point where you have enough knowledge and you have enough know-how to get to the next level. So. If any of you are interested and want to learn more, I actually have office hours. Uh, they're posted up on my blog or on my website on Femgineer, so you can have a 30-minute chat with me if any of you are first-time entrepreneurs. Um, I also have a bi-monthly mentoring service, which I actually do across the world. I know it's, it doesn't accommodate every time zone, but I try to do my best. And of course, we have a number of courses also on engineering and entrepreneurship uh, with Femgineer. So with that, I'll turn it over to Q&A. Great, so has anyone got any questions?
Hi. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, when you first started up, um, what sort of challenges did you come up, come up against and how did you get over them? Mm. <laughs> or so, what was the major ones? Yeah, uh, well, which company? <laughs> or does that not matter? M Mint, let's say. Sure. Yeah. I think one of the hardest challenges that we had um, at Mint was getting over people's perception about security and trust, right? We were all these 20 something kids building a personal finance product and a lot of people were very, very averse to using us. And so what we had to do was a couple things. We had to actually take the time to say, okay, we need to brand ourselves in a way that conveys trust, that conveys security, but it's not enough to do the marketing. We actually have to follow up. Right? And to follow up, that means that we have to encrypt all of our systems. We have to make sure that you know, all the data is secure. So it was kind of that dual um, purpose or the, the, the dual approach that actually helped us overcome that challenge with a number of people. Um, a second problem that we had was um, <laughs> recruiting. <laughs> because at the time, when we were getting started in uh, 2006, 2007, uh, all these people wanted to go and work for Facebook and Twitter that were just getting started because they were like, oh, social is so much more fun than personal finance. We're like, okay, we get it. No, we're not the most fun company uh, in terms of the product that we're building, but you know, we're still doing good and, and enacting change, right? So a lot, of, a lot of that, we had to think about how to recruit people, how to challenge them, and how to motivate them. That was also very, very difficult. Um, and I think the, the third challenge for us was um, we, when we started to take off, it was in 2008. And if you are all familiar with what happened in 2008, right, there were all these banking crises and we were kind of worried that either people would be like, you know, forget personal finance um, or they would be like, oh, I really need to think about my budgets and I really need to account for every penny that I have. And fortunately for us, it was the latter. Um, where people really cared and, and then they took notice of our product. Um, but up until then, you know, we weren't sure if people would care enough to use a solution like ours. Um, the other thing that the recession you know, caused us to fear was would we be able to get funding? Would people really tighten up their belts um, and say, or tighten up their wallets and say, hey, we're not going to give any money? But once again, because we were getting a lot of customer traction and people were becoming more budget conscious, the timing was you know, played in our favor. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah. Next question, yeah, down here. Uh, hello. Uh, how many time did it take you uh, take uh, to build the idea? I mean, from uh, dot com, from the stage that the idea just popped up in your mind to the stage that the company was operational, and then did you have like really tough, tough moments when you wanted to quit, and how did you act it? Yeah. Uh, uh, so it actually took about two years until we launched. Um, and, the, and this was all before sort of the lean startup movement and all of that was taking place. Um, so we had to basically spend um, the first, I would say, nine to 12 months building our prototype. And then we ended up actually scrapping it um, because when we hired our VP of engineering, he came in and said, this is all crap. You know, this is built by okay engineers, but we need to actually build something more solid. We need to make it so that it's more secure and so that it's more scalable. And so once he came in, we actually had to rebuild the product from the ground up again. Um, and, and that took another f almost a year before we launched. So it was about two years. Um, this, so then you asked, you know, did I ever think about quitting? Um, I don't think I ever, like, thought about quitting. I was just so excited. You know, I was just like, this is so, uh, this is so exciting. I want to be here. I want to be part of this. Um, the first time I thought about quitting was when we got acquired. And the reason I thought that is because um, I actually walked into the company that acquired us, uh, into it, and I just felt so out of place. Like, it's a 3,000-person company, and they handed me my benefits package. And at the time, I was like 27, so I said, you know, what the hell do I need a benefits package for? <laughs> what do I need health insurance? You know, I want to I wanna go out and, and build something again. I was excited. So that was the first time that I, you know, really thought about quitting. And then, of course, that was the first time I quit as well. So, yeah, for me, I was just so excited about the direction and what I was building and the enthusiasm behind the product that I didn't, you know, want to leave the team uh, or to stop building. 
Okay, great. Next question over there. Uh, hi, I would like to uh, just ask a question. If you are working uh, with teams, are you giving them control points or would you like to motivate them or you are just interested about the result of it or how do you manage it? It's everything actually. Uh, so the, the one thing I, I've learned, uh, especially from um, BusyBee, because with BusyBee, what I ended up doing was I started with a new technology. So we're, we're built on Ruby on Rails. Uh, and I wanted to do this just because uh, I was like, oh, let's try something new. And none of the engineers that I hired, uh, including my co-founder, knew how to use this. And so I got a lot of pushback initially when I said, hey, where's the product? Um, and they said, hey, we don't know how to code in this language. So I actually had to give them about three months to really become solid in that language. And I couldn't expect any results from them. And they did have a good point. right? But I had to be confident that I was giving my employees time to learn and time, and, and I was also investing time in them to, to learn. So you can't always be results focused initially when people are just learning. You have to be a little bit more nurturing. You have to think about you know, how can you empower these people? How can you get out of their way? Or how can you help you know, speed up the process a little bit? But once we got into a I'd say a uh, zone where you know, people did know how to write the code, people were delivering, then I could step in and say, okay, so we need to have this deliverable on this date, right? But I couldn't do it right from the start. And in fact, what ended up happening with BusyBee is when we were first developing the product, we were taking almost two months between every iteration, meaning every new feature or, or launch. And part of that was because we didn't have a very good process in place where designers and developers um, were interacting with each other as well as the product manager. And then the deployment itself would take you know, quite some time. So we had to put in a number of processes in place so that we could speed it up. And that took about three, three months to put in place. But then once we did that, every two weeks we were able to release. We had solid test framework, so we didn't need to hire additional um, quality assurance engineers, QA developers. We did everything in-house. So we came up with a better process, but a lot of that was me taking a step back. My, my co-founder actually said, you know, go to Spain, take a vacation, come back in two weeks, we'll figure all this out. And I had to really trust and, and delegate to him. Um, and, and so a, a lot of it was figuring out whether they needed my help, and if they said no, then trusting them because I had hired competent people. Great. Have we got any more questions? Just over there, yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk first. Okay. Um, I got a more personal question. I always got the impression that founders invest quite a lot of their time. What is your experience on that? Like how much, you, you just said that you were really excited about it and I think you also spend a lot of time on it. Uh, invest a lot of the time? Yes, that's true. Now, uh, it changes though. So for example, um, the first, I think year or two at Mint, I was probably working seven days a week. But then once we started to get more people on the team, and as I started to get closer to burnout, I stopped working seven days a week, right? Started working five days a week. Same thing with BusyBee. When I was building that first prototype, the first six to nine months, um, it was working about seven days a week. But then as I started to recruit more people, I delegated and I gave myself time. Um, so that's also a natural process. You have to learn to not work You know the ridiculous hours that you're working initially to get the thing off the ground and you have to start thinking a little bit more in terms of how you can add um, bigger value, right? And a lot of times it's not sitting there and writing code or it's not even sometimes being with your team. It's being outside, finding customers, trying to get investment or, and building awareness. Which is something unique that only founders can really do uh, for a startup. Good question. Next question, have we got any more? Yep. Um, first of all, it's clear that you're a very expert lecturer, <laughs> very direct, concise, etc. And you're now in an academic place, um, Duke University, I think you said. Um, does that mean you've given up being an entrepreneur other than your 
teaching side and your online teaching side. We've had talks um, in the last couple of days here from people who seem to go on and on with new products or you know startups. Yeah. Have you uh, decided the academics life for you prefer lecturing and so no, on? No, not at all. In fact, uh, I I only w work at Duke three days a week. Um, it's actually not a full three days a week. It's sort of three half days a week. Um, I'm certainly not tenured. I don't have a PhD, so they're not gonna put me on a tenure track. Um, I, I'm just doing it for a couple reasons. The first is, remember I said Femgineer is, is one of my startups. It's an education service startup. So the reason I'm doing it is to kind of explore new markets. We teach a lot of adults. We don't do a lot with accredited universities. So that's kind of our first test, sub, test market. Um, so I'm essentially testing a lot of the curriculum on these students. Um, second is my startup BusyBee is still alive. I'm still involved in product development, in customer development. So no, I haven't um, given up. Being a professor or a professor instructor is just something that I enjoy doing and I have wanted to do for a while. So that's why I took the opportunity. And maybe it's a good uh, place to be for people coming to you with ideas that you can help with startups. Exactly. Yeah. The other reason um, is because uh, being close to a research institution like that, there are opportunities to build more exciting products. Uh, not necessarily that these other ones aren't exciting, um, but I wanted to be a little bit closer to some, some pure technology sources. So for example, at Duke, they do a lot of research in genomics, um, which is very interesting to me. Um, and their engineering school, while it's small, um, they have a lot of great resources. They have their own mini fab. Um, so if I want to build something in hardware, I have some resources to play with that. But yes, that's that's a good point. No, haven't haven't given up. Okay, fantastic. Is that everything? Has anyone got any questions? Is that it? Okay, thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you very much.